that makes plain the deity of Christ and the inspiration of Scripture. Can I remind you of a few statements that are found in the Gospel of John? In chapter 1 of John, Christ can say to uh, Nathaniel, Believest thou? You'll see greater things than these. This is the end of the first chapter. Hereafter you'll see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, of course, to Nathaniel, that was a reference to the dream of Jacob, where when he's in exile from home, he's missing mum's apple pie and he doesn't have his father's blessing and his brother wants to kill him and he feels he's disgraced God, and God gives him a dream of a ladder connecting earth and heaven and the angels coming down and going up. And Christ says, Nathaniel, you're going to see that. That ladder is me. I'm the ladder between earth and heaven. Your requests go up to heaven via me, and the blessings come down by me. Now in chapter 2, when he cleanses the temple, and they're angry with him, he says, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. Now I want you to notice what Christ is doing. He's taking things from the Old Testament and saying they symbolize me. The ladder Jacob saw is a symbol of him, connecting earth and heaven. The temple, if you connect all the furniture of the temple, begin at the most holy place, draw a line from the ark, come through the altar of incense, come out to the laver, and then come to the altar of burnt offering, you've got a straight line. Now draw a line from the table of showbread over to the seven candlesticks, and what have you got? You've got the cross. The tabernacle rested on silver foundations. The sockets, the whole structure, were made from the redemption money paid for every firstborn child in memory of the saving of the firstborn at the time of the Passover. So the whole sanctuary rested on these redemption sockets. And everything in it pointed to Christ. The table of showbread, himself the bread of life. The candlesticks, himself the light of the world. The incense that rose up, the fragrance of his righteousness that makes my prayers, the prayers of a sinner, acceptable to God. The ark, a symbol of his heart that contains the law of God, but's overlaid with mercy, the mercy seat. So, everything in the sanctuary pointed to Christ. When you go on in the Gospel of John, he talks about Moses didn't give you that manna. We're in chapter 6 now. He says, God gave you the real manna. Now, the manna was white, round, sweet, came down from heaven. And when Christ says, I am the living manna, I am the true bread, and the white points to his purity, its roundness to his perfections, and like the manna, came down from heaven. Then you go on a little more, in John's Gospel he says, I am the light of the world, reminding them of the pillar of light that led them through the wilderness. Pillar of light at night, came a cloud to protect them from the sunshine in the heat of the day. Then he says, he that believeth on me from within him shall flow rivers of living water. He's alluding to the water that came from the smitten rock in the wilderness. So Christ is always pointing back to the Old Testament saying, these things pointed to me. I'm the ladder. I'm the true manna. I'm the uh, pillar of light. I'm the true temple, see? 
The Old Testament is full of pictures that point to the coming of the Son of God. Let me rapidly give you just a few. The first man we meet in the Bible on the sixth day has his side opened after he falls asleep. Why? So he can have a bride. Now, we come on the millenniums and we see the second Adam. That's one of the names for Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 calls Christ, I think it may be verse 45 or somewhere around there, 49. 1 Corinthians 15 says Christ is the last Adam. The first Adam on the sixth day falls asleep, has his side open to have a bride. The last Adam on the sixth day of the week, Friday, on the cross, falls asleep in death, has his sight opened by the lance of the Roman soldier, and from it comes blood and water, the symbols of what makes his church, the great gospel truths of justification by the blood, sanctification by the Holy Spirit. So, first Adam, sixth day, sleep, sight opened, what comes from it? The bride. Last Adam, sixth day, Falls asleep, side open, what comes there from makes his bride. Turn over a chapter or two and you have a good shepherd who's murdered when he's very young. Not by an alien, by his brother. So Christ, the good shepherd, when very young, is murdered. You know why Christ never lived any more than about 33? Because after 33 you begin to die. You reach your acme of health and perfection about the age of 33. After that, you lose 1% of everything every year, which means some of us haven't got much left. (laughs) So, Genesis 4, Abel, do you know what his name means? His name means breath. The book of James says, what is your life? It's but a breath, a vapour that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. So Abel, whose name means a breath, who's a good shepherd, who worships God perfectly, is murdered by his brother. Millenniums later comes his antitype, the real good shepherd, who also dies young, murdered by his brethren. The Jews hand him over, right? Come to the sixth chapter, and there's a man whose name means rest. Who's that? Noah. Noah means rest. Here for the first of 500 calls in the Bible you read the word come. Come into the ark. 500 more. And when the true Noah appears he says come unto me and I will give you rest. And Noah's family is saved only because of Noah's righteousness. God says to Noah the only have I seen righteous but bring your family. And my only hope, and your only hope, is because our Noah is perfectly righteous, and we are saved only on account of his righteousness. When we accept him, it's put to our account. So here's our Noah. You read a bit further on, and you read of a man who's a king and a priest, Melchizedek, which means... King of righteousness. That's the meaning of Melchizedek. Sadak is the Hebrew word for righteousness. Mel is the Hebrew word for king. And he rules over a place called Salem. That was the beginning of Jerusalem. So here's Melchizedek, Genesis 14, a king and a priest. His name means king of righteousness. But we're not given his father. We're not given his ancestry. Not told about his birth. Not told about his death. And the book of Hebrews chapter 7 says, don't you remember? Melchizedek, without father or mother, a king and a priest, abides a priest forever. So Melchizedek is a symbol of Jesus, who would be a king and a priest, who has neither beginning of days or end of life, because death is only a blip to him, he's raised again. So Melchizedek, king of righteousness, king of peace, points to Jesus, who would be the king priest. And there's no ancestry, no genealogy given in Genesis for him because he pointed to Christ, who has neither beginning of days or end of life. Come to the 22nd chapter, 
and you come across a beloved son. He's called an only son because the Hebrew word only sometimes means chief. He actually has a brother who's a very wild man called Ishmael. But this only beloved son is for three days under the sentence of death and he carries the wood on his back on which he's to die and goes to a place called Moriah, which is the same place as Jerusalem. And on the third day he's delivered as though in resurrection when God intervenes to save him. So please note, a beloved son, three days under the sentence of death, carrying the wood to Moriah and the last moment delivered as a resurrection. Here's the best one from Genesis. Another beloved son, but hated by his brethren, rejected by his brethren, falsely accused, imprisoned, in danger of death, associating his suffering with two men, one of whom is saved and the other lost, comes up out of prison and all that world had to worship him. Someone went before him saying, bow the knee and he's told all power on the land is given unto you and he saves the known world with the bread of life. Now you, you see where I am, don't you? The story of Joseph. Only one chapter given the story of creation, 12 to Joseph because there's nearly a hundred parallels between the life of Joseph and the life of Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John can first be found in the last 12 chapters of the book of Genesis. So let me go through that quickly again. A beloved son, hated and rejected by his brethren, sold for pieces of silver to a foreign nation. Remember? They sold him to the Ishmaelites. Put in a pit. Down into a pit. Down in the caravan. Down into Egypt. Down into a dungeon. In the dungeon, he's associated with two men, remember, the butler and the baker. One is saved, the other lost. And he comes up, and Pharaoh says, all power on the land will be given unto you. And he amasses the bread, the grain, and saves the world from famine by the bread. And people had to bow the knee to him. Those very words occur in Genesis. Bow the knee. All power is given unto him. And he sends a message to those that hated him. Come unto me, and I will nourish you. And he gives them changes of raiment, clothing. Right? What a perfect picture of God's beloved son, despised or rejected by the Jews, sold for a piece of silver by a Jew to a foreign nation, Judas to the Romans, who's put in and imprisoned, put on a cross, associated with two, of, two thieves, one of whom is saved and the other lost, who becomes the saviour of the world with the bread of life and who sends to us his crucifiers the message, come unto me, and who gives us changes of raiment. A robe of righteousness, you see. Christ gave his crucifiers his robe. And where his crucifiers? And he imputes to us his perfect character. And I need that because I'm never going to be perfect in this life. Every day has its blemishes and its failures and its sins, not willfully, but it's there. But the great gift of the gospel is that God loves sinners. This man receives sinners. He's gone to be guest with him that's a sinner. The great message of the Christian gospel is forgiveness of sins, and I need it. Every day I need it. See? So Joseph sends a message. Come unto me, and I'll nourish you. And he gives them changes of raiment. So the Old Testament is full of pictures of Jesus. Take Moses. Menaced in his childhood by a cruel king. Saved from that cruel king. Grows up to become a prophet and a lawgiver, and a saviour. Leads the twelve tribes, has seventy elders, controls the waters, supervises feeding them with bread, 
is willing to be blotted out for the sins of his people. Forgive their sin, if not blot me out of thy book which you have written. There are at least 70 parallels between the life of Moses and the life of Jesus. Jesus is delivered from a cruel king in his infancy. Jesus has 12 disciples, as Moses had 12 tribes. Jesus controls the sea. Jesus supervises feeding the people with bread, as Moses did the manna. Jesus is blotted out for the sins of his people. You'll find pictures of Jesus in the most unexpected places. Think of the mad playboy of the Old Testament. The mad playboy of the Old Testament is Samson. What a giddy life he led. But you remember when his eyes were put out and his hair began to grow as a symbol of his repentance, he has a change of heart. And as had been predicted at his birth, you know, when you read Matthew 1, the opening chapter of the New Testament, call his name Jesus for he'll save his people from their sins. He shall save his people is a quotation from a prediction made at the birth of Samson. And how did he save his people? Not by his giddy meanderings, turning the towns red and chasing the ladies of, who weren't ladies. He doesn't save them by that. But when he's penitent and he's put between two pillars and he willingly bows his head in death and breaks those pillars and that huge meeting place that houses the leaders of the Philistines collapses and Israel finds itself free because their enemies have been killed because of the death of Samson. So see the picture again. We're quoting from the book of Judges. And the Old Testament judges were deliverers. You could call the book the book of saviors. And one of them is this mad playboy who has a late repentance. And when you see him between the pillars like Christ, between the other crosses, and Samson willingly dies as Christ does, and as Christ by his death destroys the world, the flesh and the devil, principalities and powers, and delivers us, so Samson by his willing death, destroys the people back there. You have all sorts of pictures like this in the Old Testament. In one place you have Samson in a prison and he awakes at midnight and in his great strength he takes the great uh, pillars of the prison and the crossbars and he lifts them up and out and he goes up on high to a mountain. Wonderful picture of Christ in the grave. And then on the third day, he overcomes principalities and powers and ascends to heaven. Well, that's just the start on those things. Let me stop at that point in case you have some questions because then we're going to go on to Revelation. <clears throat> Any questions going out of anything we've tried to look at so far? Right, let's begin now about eschatology, apocalyptic. Eschatology just means the study of the last things. That's the seventh division of theology. We talked about theology, Christology, pneumatology, so anthropology, soteriology, ecclesiology. Eschatology, study of the last things. You know that the Oxford Dictionary, the big one, tells you the date any word was first used in literature. If you look up eschatology, it says this word was first used in 1844 in a derogatory sense. Here's something you must never forget. The study of the divisions of theology in their time frames is very important. What do I mean? There are two out of the seven that were neglected for most of the Christian era. Pneumatology, study of the Holy Spirit. Practically nothing done, very little. Some by John Calvin, some by Wesley. But very little study 
on the Holy Spirit for most of the 2,000 years of the Christian era. Very little. The other one is eschatology. Everything good on eschatology, the study of the last things, that's what it means, can apply to the world or it can apply to individuals. As regards individuals, it means death and dying and resurrection. But it's the the last things about the world, second advent, judgment, the general resurrection, see? Right. But all the good things written on that seventh division for 2,000 years could be put on a postcard. That's why the Oxford Dictionary says it's first used this word, eschatology, 1944, in a derogatory sense. Up till then, it was a prodigal among the, the families of religious themes. They didn't pay much attention to eschatology. Some, but not much. And also true of the Holy Spirit. Now, why is that important? For the first time in history, we now have the means of sending the gospel to the whole world. First time in history. To the whole world. For the first time in history, we can destroy our own world. The world has shrunk like an orange. It's now a neighbourhood. It's not a brotherhood. Not a brotherhood. 100 million people put to death last century. 100 million people. Since the end of World War II, there have been scores of other wars. A few years back, there were 44 nations involved in civil war. You don't hear about most of these because the media is controlled by a few people who appeal mainly to the people between 18 and 34 because they're the adventurous, adventurous buyers. And the media is controlled by the ratings because the ratings spell money. Money spells survival. So most of the things that happen in the world we don't hear about at all because it may not put up the ratings, may not appeal to the 18 to 34. For example, in the Sudan, millions of people have been murdered, crucified and made slaves in recent years. We don't hear about that, very little. You read about it in some Christian journals. Millions of people, boys over eight years of age, have been crucified. Millions turned into slaves. Many Christian groups raise money to free these slaves in the Sudan. It's a conflict between the Mohammedans and the professed Christians. But you don't hear much about it. So there have been scores and scores of civil war you hardly hear about. And gold has been engaged in civil war now for nearly half a century. It's hard for us to grasp. We live in a wonderful country, the lucky country. But in the Cold War, five million died in Korea. We hardly know anything about that war. Hardly know anything about it. It was a debacle. It was a real mess to start with. And ultimately they found they couldn't win it. MacArthur never spent one whole night ever in Korea. You know that? That's not a shot at MacArthur, it's just a fact. Never, ever spent one whole night. And of course, he wanted to solve the war by bringing in the atom bomb, which may have meant the Russians also would use the atom bomb because they were behind China. And if so, probably we wouldn't be here. So the world now is different to what it's ever been before. For over half a century, we've been under the shadow of nuclear weapons. And once only one nation had it, then two, then six, now there are 20 nations with the potential for producing nuclear weapons. And some of them are governed by fanatical people. So we live in a different world. When I was studying in Manchester, I was amazed to see the most literate, scholarly magazine of theology coming out with whole issues on eschatology. Now, when I was becoming a Christian in the 1940s, 
Only cults had anything to do with eschatology. It was cultic. Respectable churches never dealt with it. I went to the Anglican church Sunday by Sunday. I never ever heard anything about eschatology. And then 30 years later, here I am at university and it's being flooded with magazines of the highest quality all talking about eschatology. Why? Because our world has changed. It's become destructible. As one man put it, it's been shown the universe is inflammable. We're only waiting for some fool to put a match to it. You know, Russia has lost a lot of its uranium stores. Some of it is in the hands of terrorists. They can make dirty bombs. Only God has restrained the use of nuclear weapons. It's the only weapon ever invented that hasn't gone into widespread use. When the machine gun was invented, they said it's too terrible to use. Now it's almost a toy. But here's a weapon, the most terrible that's ever been made, and the providence of God has been over the world. You know, one of the names given to God, it's found in Second Thessalonians 2, is the restrainer. The restrainer. The Holy Spirit moves even in the lives of very wicked men and restrains them from destroying the world. So eschatology has become to the fore because it's more relevant than ever before. Now, in the 19th century, my parents were born at the end of the 19th century. Their world was different. Their world was summed up in the attitude to the Titanic when it came out 10 years later, about 1910. You remember the old salt? Answer the old lady who said, I hear the ship is indestructible. And he says, Madam, God himself couldn't destroy this ship. Now that was the mood of the 19th century. Invention was beginning to crowd upon invention toward the end of the century. In the first two decades of the new century, we'd have electricity working its wonders, the aeroplane doing its job, used for killing as well as for transporting. A whole new world is burgeoning, and the mood of man until the outbreak of World War I was tremendously optimistic. They thought that a war was over, in the British Empire, the sun never set. Neither did they ever do anything wrong, not much. You know, 54 of the poorest countries of the world are in Africa. Of the 54 poorest countries of the world, most are in Africa. And in the days of colonialism by Britain, by Holland, by Belgium, by Germany, those people were turned into mere machines. Terrible, terrible brutality and selfishness from the European nations in Africa. Terrible. Of course, the situation is worse now because of the tin pot dictators and because of the spread of AIDS, which in some countries is killing about one in every three or four people. Others about 1 in 10. The World Health Organization has pretty well wiped Africa from its books. It has gone too, far. gone too far. So the world is in a desperate plight and if ever there was an age where eschatology should be studied, it's now. It's now. What about pneumatology? The study of the Holy Spirit. Neglected? All the early centuries were spent studying the nature of Christ, nature of the Father, how men are saved, nature of man, but not pneumatology and not eschatology. Very little. What's the importance of this? Well, we've come to the time when both come into their own because the Bible foretells that the gospel will go to the world in a final generation under the power of the Holy Spirit. In other words, Pentecost will take place all over the world, in all the big cities of the world, in the towns of the world, in the villages of the world. Christians 
empowered by the Holy Spirit, will make the final proclamation of the gospel, which will polarise the world into the fours and the against. Many more against than for. That's why Christ can say, then shall be great tribulation, such as was not from the beginning of the world until then. So I suggest to you that pneumatology is very important because only in the power of the Holy Spirit, as on the Pentecostal times, 50 days after the resurrection of Christ, only in that sort of power will the gospel ever spread. In that day, the divisions between denominations will be forgotten. In that day, the squabblings over minutia will, will go. The big things will be faith, hope, love, the gospel of the forgiveness of sins, the love of God. The big things will be seen as big. Today, the tendency in churches is to tell everybody what they must not do. But you know, 3,000 sermons on the law won't convert anybody. One sermon on grace at Pentecost converted 3,000. Standards without the gospel harden the heart and cut off the ears. Everybody knows they've got troubles. Everybody knows they ought to be better. Everybody knows they do things they wish they hadn't done. Everybody wishes they had more strength to do some things better than they do it, see. What we want is forgiveness of sins. So the final proclamation of the message will be the love of God manifests as the cross that brings forgiveness to every believer and with that forgiveness comes the power to hate evil. Not perfection, not absolute sinlessness, not possible in this life. We all have an old sinful nature. So the world now is gasping for hope as a drowning man gasps for air. Love cannot last unless it's accompanied by hope and faith. The death of hope leads to hope for death. And life is tough. The book of Revelation is a book of the rainbow. You'll find the rainbow is a conspicuous symbol. And the rainbow, of course, is a symbol of hope. But it's a junction, isn't it, of sunshine and rain. And life is a mixture of pain and glory, of goodness and badness. See? The book of Revelation is a book of hope because it points to the end of the world when evil will be abolished. There will be a perfect world where righteousness reigns and it gives us the assurance in the meantime that trusting in Christ, all things can be like the cross. No sadder day than that Good Friday. It was a Black Friday, but it became Easter Sunday. The cross is transformed into resurrection and it's meant to be a pattern of all our crosses, all our tragedies. You lose a son, you lose a daughter, you lose a spouse, you lose a job. Life is full of pain. The cross is the pattern viewed by hope and faith that pain is not permanent, that the cuffs and buffets of human existence are temporary. Now that's part of the message of the book of Revelation. It's a book of hope and without hope we can't live. I want to read you the best statement I have ever read on how we should try to deal with the things that break our hearts. Listen. This is ascribed to an old priest 500 years ago who left a basket of fruit at the door of a poor family where tragedy had knocked. And with the basket of fruit, he left this message. The gloom of the world is but a shadow. Behind it, yet within our reach, is joy. There is radiance and glory in the darkness. Could we but see? To see, we only have to look. I beseech you, look. Life is so generous a giver, but we, judging its gifts by their covering, cast them away as ugly or heavy or hard. 
remove the covering. You'll find beneath it a loving splendor, woven of love, by wisdom, with power. Welcome it, grasp it, and you touch the angel's hand that brings it. Everything we call a trial, a sorrow, or a duty, believe me, that angel's hand is there. The gift is there. And the wonder of an overshadowing presence. Life is so full of meaning and purpose. So full of beauty beneath its covering. You'll find earth but cloaks your heaven. Courage then to claim it, that's all. But courage you have. And the knowledge that we are pilgrims together. Wending through unknown country home. And so I greet you. With the prayer that for you, now and forever, the day breaks and the shadows flee away. That's a beautiful statement, isn't it? But that's the meaning of the cross. That's the meaning of the cross. The shadows will come that break your heart. Losses and crosses dot all, dot all our ways. See? But Sundays are coming. Calvary is not the last word. Tragedy is not the last word. Glory is. Resurrection is. Now, that's what the book of Revelation is about. Do you have any other questions before we go? Lord willing, we will open the book of Revelation next time. But this is a background that we need to have. It would be an advantage, as Alain has said, if you could spend some time with the book of Revelation before we get together. If you want to read what lies ahead, expressed in symbols, you should read chapter 11, chapter 13, chapter 17. They described in symbolic form what the future holds. But then you should go back to chapter 1, because we will begin not with 11, 13 or 17. We'll begin with chapter 1. Any, any questions? Well, I'd invite you to stand and we'll just have a closing prayer. Thank you, Lord. There are good grounds for hope and for faith and for love. And these grounds are found in the cross of Christ. When our hearts threaten to break, help us remember Calvary and the third day, the day of glorification, transfiguration, ascension, Fix our faith there, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen.